Today is September 9th. This is the day that Prince Charles was crowned King of England. And with this event, I'm speculating that there's going to be false prophets who are going to speak up claiming that King Charles is the Antichrist. So I figure that this is a good opportunity to talk about the Antichrist, the son of perdition, and when he will be revealed. So let's get into this. We've been taught for so long that we are waiting for this final world leader called the Antichrist that barely anyone questions if it's even true. Let's start with Matthew 7 and in verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So the reason I'm starting here is because it's pertinent to understand this in order to understand who the Antichrist actually is. If you haven't looked at that word for Antichrist, today's your opportunity to have a look at that and then evaluate if the King of England is actually the Antichrist. So this verse should get your attention and it should cause the reader to ask a couple of questions. Number one, how many is many? Because it starts off with, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, why doesn't he know them who used his name? Because it says, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And what is working iniquity? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are all relevant to the Antichrist. Let me show you how. Let's start by answering these questions. How many is many? So let's pick this up in Matthew 7, 13, which this is the same context of Matthew 7, 22, And this is going to answer the what, how many is many. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So this is the picture I, I get in my mind when I think about these two things. You get the wide gate. You get the multi-lane highway going in both directions. It's the path that everybody takes. And then you have the narrow path. It's single file. You have to go through it one at a time. What this communicates to me is that it's each one of our own responsibility to know what we believe. Don't expect to go with the crowd and be saved. Don't expect to go with the crowd and receive your rewards. The path to life is well defined, but it's one you have to walk alone. You have to confirm the things that you believe. Don't just go with the pop, what's popular. Don't just go with what everybody else is doing, right? That's why there are many who will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Remember, we're still in the context of the Antichrist. I'm going to show you who the Antichrist is and when the son of perdition will be revealed. So why doesn't he know them? To understand this, this is where we get into who the Antichrists are. Now, this is a very simple word study. Anybody can do it. There are only four usages, and I've gone through the trouble of listing them for you here. They were all in First and Second John. So the first one is in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So the first usage of the word Antichrist tells us that there's many Antichrists. So this idea that we're waiting for this final Antichrist, this final world leader, it's not scriptural. Um, false prophets, false teachers have used hermeneutics in order to infer other places in the scripture 
that a man or a person is an antichrist. And hopefully you'll see that by the by the time we're done with this teaching. But we're looking at these four usages. These are the only four usages of the word antichrist. It's never used in Revelation. It's never used in Daniel. It's never used anywhere else in the Bible. It is only used in First and Second John. So continuing in First John 2, Verse 22 is the second usage, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now, I want to point out here that Antichrists are those who deny the Father and the Son. That's going to be important later on, but I want to point that out to you now. Let's look at the next usage, 1 John 4, 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So this spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. And here's the final cherry on the top of the cake. Second John 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. This is why there are many who will come to the Lord saying, because the spirit of antichrist is a deceiver. They are lying to you. That spirit is lying to you and it's your responsibility to identify that lie and hopefully i can give you enough information so that you can see that today that you are being lied to we're not waiting for a final antichrist they are already here they're in the church there's many of them and they're lying to us and here's how we identify them they deny the father and the son they deny that Jesus is the Messiah, and they deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So what is working iniquity? I'm going to help you identify antichrists around you and in the church. They're the ones working iniquity. So what is iniquity? So iniquity is lawlessness. And think, so this is God's law, God's law not man's law. God gave us the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, verses 3 through 7, uh, one of which is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, I want to point you to Romans 1, 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So when asked... What was the most important commandment? This is how Jesus replied and in Mark 12, 29. And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So what is working lawlessness? What is working iniquity? Not teaching these commandments. Not living according to this, these commandments. Especially worshiping anything above the creator. Especially worshiping the creature more than the creator. The Antichrists are people in the church. This, this is, should be no surprise to you. We've looked at the four usages of the Antichrist, right? Of the word Antichrist. I'm not making this up. Here's the usages. 1 John 2, 18 and 22. 1 John 4, 3 and 2 John 7. So Antichrists are people in the church. So now let's talk about the son of perdition. I'm going to show you that the son of perdition is not the Antichrist. This is one of the things that so many people are getting wrong by not actually going to the scriptures 
or themselves, they're just believing the crowds. They're taking the wide path, which is leading them to destruction. Because not understanding the difference is the reason why you don't understand the truth and the reason why that spirit of Antichrist can deceive you and is lying to you and trying to get you to believe the lie. We're going to see that the son of perdition is not the Antichrist. And to do that, we look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, let's break this down. So what I'm going to show you now is that the man of sin, the son of perdition, from 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, is actually the doctrine of the Antichrists. They are not one in the same. That is the wide path. That is what the majority of the churches are teaching, is that the son, man of sin, or lawless one, the son of perdition, is the final antichrists. And they want you to believe that it's a man. The reality is, and you can start to see this already as we looked at the, the only usages of the word antichrists, clearly indicate that there are many of them. They've been in the church since this was written, so for 2,000 years, since Jesus was crucified. Antichrists are the people that are in the church, and they have specific attributes. They teach that Jesus is not the Messiah. They do not teach the Father and the Son, and they don't teach that Jesus came in the flesh, right? Those are the three attributes of Antichrists. Whereas the son of perdition is the one who sits in the temple showing himself that he's God. Do you understand the difference? Do you understand that there's a clear, there are clear attributes to the two of them? And I'm going to show you how it's the son of perdition is the doctrine of the Antichrist. It's not a person. There's a reason why it's called the son of perdition, and it's pointing to the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, before you click off my channel, I want to point out that Jesus talks about the seven churches in the book of Revelation, right? All of those churches, except for one, most likely teach the Trinity. So just teaching the Trinity does not make you an antichrist. It's, it's only the version of the Trinity that insists that Jesus is God. And I've been to these churches. I've been to a church, uh, a Pergamum church and a Thyatira church, that insist that Jesus is the creator. And a lot of you watching this, this video probably think that, that Jesus is the creator. He's not. His father is the creator. He is the son. There are many churches out there who teach the Trinity, but they get it right. These, the father is not the son. The son is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the father. The ones, the mark of the beasts, the son of perdition is the doctrine that the father is God. The son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Now, re remember those four usages of the word antichrist. They deny the father and the son. The reason is, is because they're claiming they're both the same. They are distinct and independent. They say that Jesus is not the Messiah. They do that by saying he's God. They don't say that he's sent from God. They say that he is God, the creator. If he's the creator, how can he be the Messiah? So they may not even say it directly, but by claiming that he's the creator, he cannot be the Messiah. The creator is perfect. In him is no darkness, he is light. If he had to be the savior, that would indicate that he screwed up, but he didn't. Everything that God did, and this is, this is the thing that why this is such a dangerous doctrine is because it actually minimizes God. God is so much bigger 
than just one man. If if it was just a man who was God, they want you to think that he that he made an error, he screwed up, and he had to save us from that error. No, God did everything right from the very beginning. He set into motion the perfect laws that make up our reality, right? And knowing full well that we would sin, we know that he knew that because he wrote the story in the stars. Psalm, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork, day unto day utter the speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. If you continue reading that, it talks about the bridegroom and his, his coming out and going forth. Well, that bridegroom is the foreshadowing of the Savior, right? So this is the doctrine that antichrists in the church teach. And hopefully you'll see what I mean by the son of perdition is the doctrine of antichrists. And the reason is because they claim God the son. Now, hopefully you're not condemning yourself because probably six out of seven people watching this video um, are exposed to the Trinity. Have uh, Maybe you've even dedicated your life to studying it. I have met people, they've convinced themselves so deeply, I would definitely call them sealed because they cannot see clear logic. For instance, they are saying that the Father is the Son. Now, that is a violation of nature. God gave us nature in order to understand Him and understand reality, understand truth. There is no son who is his own father. It's it's impossible. They'll call it a paradox. And the reason it's a paradox is because it's a lie. It cannot be. There is nothing that can create itself. God did not create himself. He always existed. He created other things. He created his son. The Everything that God created is considered creature, right? That's his creation. But he did not create himself. He just always existed. So you understand God is so much bigger than just one man. And the Trinity minimizes the creator. This is why the creator is worthy of our worship and our admiration. And he is the only God. Anything, be, be, anything that you worship as your God other than the creator is going to be smaller than him. So he is the only one that should be your God, your creator. Worshiping anything else as your creator is iniquity. And you're violating God's commandments. And you're violating even what Jesus commanded, saying, uh, Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Those people in the church with the spirit of Antichrist are not our enemies. I'm going to say that again. The people in the church that are deceived by the spirit of Antichrist are not your enemies. They're simply deceived. That's why the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Stop treating people as your enemy because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This also shows us that the son of perdition is the doctrine and not a man because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against that doctrine of God, the Son. Let's look at this again. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Let no man deceive you. Remember the spirit of Antichrist is a deceiver? By any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Did you know that they killed Jesus for calling his body the temple of God? 
let's look at this in Mark 14, 58. These are the witnesses that they got, that Pontius Pilate got to testify against Jesus. And this is what they said. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made without hands. Let's look at another instance of this when people were mocking and wagging their heads and reviling Jesus. Matthew 27, 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Okay, so what are they talking about? So what is what are the the two that witnessed against Jesus and what are these revilers? What are these passerbys talking about? So we we look at this to understand what they're referring to, look at John 2:19. Jesus answered and said unto them, "Destroy this temple, and in 3 days I will raise it up." Then said the Jews, "Forty and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in 3 days?" But he spake of the temple of his body. So this is the context of what I'm trying to point out to you here. This is what the son of perdition does, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what the son of perdition does. The temple is no longer a building. The temple is our body. Jesus told us this, and this is why they killed him, because he told them that the body was going to be the temple of God. And it is, because the Holy, that's where the Holy Spirit dwells within. The Holy Spirit is the gift from God. They don't ever talk about that much in the Trinity. Usually they always talk about the Father and the Son and how they're the same, or the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same, but they don't really ever tell you what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is that gift from God that sits in the temple of God. Our body is the temple of God. It is not a building. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That is that gift of Holy Spirits. The son of perdition is revealed in those who are left behind after the rapture. So this is something that I've just come to realize recently. Um, I've gone back and forth on my understanding on what the falling away is. Um, you know, when I first started studying it, the general consensus from people was that it was the rapture and that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, especially once I, I found that revelation 12, three and four sign that showed the separation of the church. Go watch my videos on uh, the great red dragon to understand what I'm talking about on that, the, on those signs. One possibility, and this is the one that's seeming more likely to me now is that the son of perdition is revealed when those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God are gathered together, and those who believe he is God the Son are the ones left behind, then he will be revealed. I'm a workman, so you know I don't claim to be a, um, a prophet. I don't claim to talk to any spirits or angels or have dreams or visions in regards to this stuff. So understand that this is my... I'm just teaching you how I understand things when I work the scripture and I will flip flop on things. That's how it works when we're working the scripture. So you can accuse me and revile me for saying, you know, I, I taught one thing before and now I'm teaching another thing, you know, I'm being flippant or something like that. But understand, I'm not making any claims here other than what I've worked. I'm a workman of the word. I'm, I'm giving my testimony of what I'm seeing in the scripture. I'm effectively a witness. So this is my current account, and it may change as new information comes in. That's the big thing, is until all this information was revealed, all we could do was guess. We could do the best that we could um, and guess, for instance, what the seals being open meant. Once they're opened and we have the proof of what they were, then we know for sure. So just like um, the son of perdition isn't fully revealed right now, and I'm trying to show you that it seems like one possibility of that falling away, revealing the son of perdition is in those who are left behind. And, you know, think about the, the 10 virgins 
five are taken, five are left behind. That matches with the um, my work on the Great Red Dragon with the churches because out of six of the churches, um, three are being devoured by the great red dragon and three are being thrown down to the earth right that's very likely the revealing of the man of sin the son, the son of perdition so antichrists are the people in the church they teach that jesus is not the messiah they teach that the father is the son and they do not teach that he came in the flesh because they teach that he's God, right? They teach that he is the creator. So effectively, antichrists are teaching the Trinity. Now, there are variations of the Trinity. Like I said, I've been to a lot of churches that teach the Trinity that, very, that make the very clear distinction that the Father is not the Son and is not the Holy Spirit. If that's what they're teaching, uh, that's right. That's not the Son of Perdition. The Son of Perdition is teaching that God, that Jesus is God, right? The Trinity teaches worshiping a man, and we know that that's iniquity. That is lawlessness because the Ten Commandments very clearly say, thou shalt not have no other gods before me, right? Even if it's his own son. You don't worship his own son before him. His son is a creature. His son is a man. It's part of the creation. So the teaching, the Trinity is working iniquity, working that lawlessness. And that's exactly what the man of sin is, the son of perdition. He's the lawless one. This is why Jesus doesn't know those who are using his name. Those that are casting out devils in the name of God the Son, those that are working miracles in the name of God the Son, those that are prophesying in the name of God the Son, Jesus doesn't know them because they are doing the works in the name of another Jesus. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Hopefully I've been clear in this. So every time I hear somebody mention that they think a certain person is the Antichrist, like right now it's starting to ramp up that people think that King Charles is the Antichrist. This is what I think about. You know that line from Game of Thrones? Um, this is Peter Baelish, or Littlefinger. He says, the realm. Do you know what the realm is? It's the thousand blades of Aegon's enemies, a story we agree to tell each other over and over until we forget that it's a lie. This is what this is what I think of every time I hear somebody telling the telling us that this this so and so may be the antichrist. The antichrist. Do you know who the antichrist is? It's the man who sits in the temple of God. A story we agree to tell each other over and over until we forget that it's a lie. It's a lie because antichrists are the people in the church pushing the doctrine that somebody, a man, is God. They're teaching that. The Father is the Son. They're teaching that Jesus never wasn't a human, but he was a deity. You understand? So this is the image of the beast from Revelation 13. Um, man was formed, made, and created on the sixth day. You can go look that up in Genesis. Um, so six often represents is the number for man. So you have the three crosses. You have a man on each one of those crosses. You have six, 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 six. That is the image of the beasts. The truth of this is, and this is what you won't hear in most churches, is that there were actually four crucified with Jesus. And we see that because the word thief and malefactor are not the same. And you see this a lot of times in churches, and this is what happens with Antichrist, is teachers will assume that one word is equivalent to another. They'll assume that thief is equivalent to malefactor. They'll assume that antichrist is equivalent to son of perdition. If God meant for antichrist to be the son of perdition, he would have said antichrist. The antichrist, uh, you know, the falling away can't happen until the antichrist is revealed. So don't change the scripture. Um, you know, the words used are the words that are meant to be used. So, and you can see this even better when you look at the Greek. The word robber or thief is the word lestai. And the word criminal or malefactor is kekorgoi. They're not the same. Where we get these is from Luke and Matthew. So in Luke 23, 32 through 33, and there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were 
come to the place which is called Calvary, there they were crucified with him. And the malefactors on one on the right hand and the other on the left. So you have Jesus, you have the malefactor on the right hand and the malefactor on the left. No, no mention of thief, and they're not the same. We understand that there are thieves here from Matthew 27, 35 through 38. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Thief, thief. See how there's four? But that's not all. If you look at John 19, 18, it says Jesus was in the midst of them and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. You understand how that works? So they broke the legs of two people before they came to Jesus. If there were only three crucified with Jesus, they would have had to break this guy's legs, walk around Jesus, break this guy's legs, then come to Jesus. See, it doesn't make sense. So this is why studying the scripture is important to catch these hidden gems. And one other thing I'll throw out there, it's very hard to substantiate, but it's highly possible that he wasn't even crucified on a cross. Because one method of crucifixion was actually just on tree stump, tree trunks like this. Because um, they crucified a lot of people. It was corporal punishment, and they did it a lot. Anybody who wouldn't declare Caesar as God, they would crucify. Um, and they wouldn't take the time to put these things together. They would just chop down a tree um, and line the roads with them. They, you think they wanted to do the extra work for the comfort of those being crucified? No. This is what actually makes more sense to me. There is some historical evidence to show that this is how crucifixions took place. There is also some historical evidence that show that crosses were used. But you can see how this is the lie. This is the image of the beast. Is number one, it's scripturally inaccurate. And number two, it's used to emphasize God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is where you get that 666. In fact, the Greek word... Um, used for 603 score and six is chi kashi stigma, which translates to Christ crossed tattoo or Christ cross mark or quite literally tattoo of Christ cross. So the mark of the beast is those who are sealed to Christ's cross. If you believe that your fight is against a man, you're believing a lie. If you believe that a man is your creator, you are believing a lie. This is what the devil does. The devil wants you to hate your fellow man. This is where conflict comes from. Hating other people, jealousy, envy, strife, those things. What's the second commandment according to Jesus? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything the devil does is to get you to hate man, to get you to hate your fellow man. He wants you to think that a man is your God. He wants you to think that a man is your enemy. He wants you to think that we're waiting for this man to come sit into the temple and declare himself God. It's a trick of the devil. God wants you to love your neighbor. The devil wants you to worship a man as God, taking the rightful worship away from the true God and creator. God wants you to worship him. He is the true creator. He is your true heavenly father. So the trick is on the devil, though, because God used the Antichrist to save us. Consider when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. In John 3.14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You understand what's going on here? 
So the serpent being lifted up, God knew that the adversary would take the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and try to use it to take people away from God. But the trick is on the devil because the devil, (laughs) it caused the devil to push the crucifixion throughout the entire world. So while the devil bruises the heel of Jesus and that he gets some people to believe God the Son via the Antichrist, the trick is on the devil because the devil spread the gospel over the entire world trying to deceive people. Now, there are many who are deceived because this is an individual walk. Remember, the path is narrow. This is on you to understand this yourself. Don't just believe me. I'm just a man. I'm just a workman of the scripture. I'm nobody special. I'm just studying. I'm walking this path for myself, and I'm hopefully giving you ammunition to work it for yourself. Um, You know, and validate what I'm saying. If I'm wrong, prove me that I'm wrong. Um, I've been in church. I've been in hurt. I've been hurt by churches that want me to hate my fellow man, even though they call it love. It's really hate because they want you to hate everybody that's not them, that doesn't believe the way they believe. If the devil had known what he was doing, he would have never crucified Jesus. If the devil had known what he was doing, he probably would have never pushed the Trinity. He would have never sent that deceiving Antichrist into the world. So check this out. In Isaiah 6, 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. The reason the trick is on the devil is because God made it so easy to be saved. That all you have to do is let that coal, that hot coal of the Son of God, touch your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Stop working iniquity by teaching that a man is God. Start confessing that God raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. Don't deny the Father and the Son. God bless you.